Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to give my poster uh, at this time. It's about our first cold fusion experiments that recorded the correlation between excess heat and helium-4. And uh, this was done in 1990. We were the first ones to show this, the correlation, that excess heat is correlated with the helium-4 production. Uh, the, what led up to this study was Julian Swinger proposed at the ICCF-1 meeting, the first meeting, that a, a H plus D fusion reaction could be what's going on and it forms helium-3. So I, I wanted to look for helium-3, but as long as you're looking for helium-3, you might as well look also for helium-4. It's the same method. And, uh, but before we even got to look, studying the helium-4, we had to prove that we could fill flasks with boil off nitrogen at China Lake in California, ship them to Texas, and those samples did not show any helium-4 or helium-3, of course. And it, so this study was done in collaboration between China Lake Navy Laboratory and the University of Texas. Ben Bush correlated, co coordinated the work at the University of Texas. He was a co-author on many of our papers. These are, these are the possible reactions that we were considering. The H plus D reaction, if, if we get helium-3, D plus D reaction to go into helium-4, and maybe even deuterium and boron-10 as another possibility. And uh, uh, over here is the energy that each reaction gives. We're gonna try to determine if we dizzy helium-4, how does it match up with 23.85 MeV per helium-4? So that was our, that, that was our, high, our, our reason for experiment and our hypothesis is helium-3 or helium-4, either one, the main fusion product? And the, the experimental answer needed for that for this question. And uh, we, we did this uh, using the calorimetry of China Lake. Uh, I did that work. And at the University of Texas, Dr. Benjamin J. Bush, or F. Bush, did the helium measurements, or he set up. He, he actually had the mass spectrometers there do the measurements, but he helped repair everything. And uh, we worked out a method where uh, the mass, well, the, the mass spec itself could, could uh, resolve easily, easily separate DT, D2 gas from helium-4 gas. And the activated charcoal filter also separated them time. Because, uh, going through the filter, the the D2 got slowed down and, and not so much for the helium-4. And this was published in the Journal of Electrochemical, uh, Chem Electroanalytical Chemistry publication in 1991. We did the experiments late in 1990, but the publication came out as a preliminary, preliminary note in 1991, early, around March. And it's important to note that we did previously prove that you could ship boil off nitrogen flasks from California to Texas without any helium-4. That's because boil off nitrogen did not have any helium-4 in it, for, as for, at least we couldn't measure any. So that was a carrier gas we used. And it should be mentioned also, we didn't know this at the time, but these experiments produced, uh, proved to be the largest excess power that we ever measured at the China Lake Navy Laboratory. It was a special Johnson Matthew Palladium and it did produced a, a large effect and that really made the, the results more, more, more important, I think. Uh, we didn't know how much helium-4 we should even look for, but uh, I've worked out a few years ago uh, a way to calculate that by evaluating all the constants and the helium-4 in parts per billion, uh, it fits this equation and with the Pow excess power in watts and the current in amps. Uh, the more excess power, the more helium-4. The higher the current, the more it gets diluted with the D2 and O gas, O2 gases produced by electrolysis. And uh, since then, some people come out and said, we can use helium-4 instead, instead of calorimetry, and that's true. If you turn this equation around, you can use the amount of helium-4 uh, if, if, if at all, gets out of the platinum and doesn't stay in the platinum cathode, you can calculate the excess heat that's going on at that moment you collected that sample. And uh, the details are in the book. Uh, 
Jean Paul Barbarian editor published in 2020. Uh, these are the results of that 1990 experiment. And using the previous theoretical equation, we now can uh, note here on this column, the parts per billion of helium four. And these are the experimental excess power uh, that we measured. And uh, we didn't, we, Ben Bush did not report it in terms of amount of helium four, but he mentioned on the mass spec, it'd be a large peak, a medium peak, or a small peak or no peak. And you see, they pretty well matched up. A few exceptions, the red ones are ones where we had a rather large calorimetric error because the electrolyte level got too low and you could have recombination going on exposed metal surfaces. So those probably ought to be dismissed, but other than that, it fits quite well. Uh, when this paper was published, the first thing critics came out with that helium-4 can diffuse through glass. And that's might be what we're seeing. And uh, we didn't know how fast that would diffuse, but later on, a, a year later, we did measure, we found that was not a factor. The diffusion rate, even with using these same flasks, the diffusion rate is much too slow for us to measure any effect from that source. And uh, uh, these are the flasks filled with D2O2, same as experiments. And the mean value is 0 0.18 uh, parts per billion per day. If, and our detection limit based on Ben Bush uh, table is about five parts per billion. And so dividing one by the other, it would take about 28 days for the helium four to equal, just, just equal our detection limit. And most experiments were done well before, well in, in much less time than we show there. And uh, so uh, this experiments did show that helium four is slowed down when the flask is filled with D2 plus O2 because D2 also diffuse, diffuses through glass. So it's going in the opposite direction as the helium four coming in. And, and that is, it seems logical that it would slow it down the helium four diffusion rate, which it does. Uh, well, the first set was probably our best experiments, larger excess power, but we, in fact, we had trouble getting excess power again the rest of 1991 until the end of the year. Almost the very end of the year, we had found two Johnson Matthey, a, a new electrode that would produce excess heat. And this was double blind. We didn't know about the helium four measurements and, and Brian Oliver who could measure to 0.1 part per billion did not know about our excess heat measurements until they're turned into a third party. That was Professor Legowski of the University of Texas. But you see here, the one with the largest excess power experimentally gave the largest amount of helium four. The one middle gave the middle amount and the one small gave the smallest amount of helium four. So as a double blind experiment, they did, did match up. And in fact, they're not too far off what you'd expect theoretically. And uh, from this data, the most accurate helium-4 measurements we ever did had, or had done by Brian Oliver, we calculated mean value of energy per helium-4, 30 plus or minus 9 million electron volts per helium-4. McCurvey later reported something similar to ICCF-8 in 2000, 31 plus or minus 13 MeV per helium-4. So uh, it's not surprising that it's higher because some of the helium does get absorbed in the palladium. And if half the helium was absorbed, this, the 23.8 would be doubled. It'd be about 47 MeV per helium four, because we would only be measuring half of it. And so uh, I think anywhere between 23 and, and up in the upper 30s or early late, low 40s would be, would be valid because of the amount that might be absorbed within the palladium. A third set of helium-4, uh, we finally had funding to do this in 1993-94. So we made metal flasks, we sent the samples off uh, into another laboratory in Amarillo, Texas, Bureau of Mines, US Bureau of Mines. Their error that reported was 1.3, if you average these over here, uh, 1.3 part per billion was, uh, these are the, their errors on their measurements. The average is 1.3 part per billion. 
So they were in between what Bush measured five parts per billion and what Brian Oliver was able to do. The best person in the world for helium four was Brian Oliver. And he got it down to 0.1 part per billion for helium four. Uh, we also included in this the study, the study, the first study was with a platinum boron cathode, not pure platinum cathode, but we also got helium four with a platinum boron cathode and close to the right amount. Uh, besides the measurement of helium four, the 1990 experiment, which gave the largest excess heat, had other signs of nuclear reactions. Uh, signs of radiation, there were fogging of dental film and x-ray film in both cells. Uh, there were periods of high counts with a Geiger muter detector. Uh, the tritium content during the whole experiment increased by 78%. And so there was apparently some tritium produced. We tried to measure neutrons. My brother uh, worked, worked, at Rock, worked at Rocky Flats, was a nuclear measurement expert. And or we tried to activate gold and Indian foil, which activate when there's enough neutrons. And we didn't see any activation, so but he could set a limit. The neutron production was less than 10 to the fourth neutrons per second. We now know it's much less than that. There are some neutrons produced, but it's even smaller than that. Uh, we ran H2O control cells, five control cells. They gave no excess heat, no helium four, and no radiation. Our conclusions from these, especially from this 1990 study, but including also the 1995, that studies up to 1995 when we had Navy funding, the Fleischmann Pond's excess heat effect does definitely produce helium-4. And the results correlate best with the fusion reaction D plus D going to helium-4 with an energy of 23.85 MeV per helium-4. Uh, the best experimental value was 30, plus or minus nine MeV per helium four. Uh, this could easily be explained by 20% of the helium being retained in the palladium. And, and that's not surprising. Uh, radiation and tritium also detected, but we never measured any helium three. I forgot to mention that earlier, but we tried, but we can never detect any helium three production. The H2O control system gave, uh, systems, uh, gave no excess heat and no helium-4 production and also no radiation effects. And if you take all the experiments, I didn't show them all here, but they're, they're about 33 experiments. Uh, they, some produced heat and helium, some did not and so on. And the ones that did not are usually the ones without no excess power or else H2O controls. The, ads, the probability of that coming, that getting that result was calculated accurately as one chance in 750,000 that could be due to random errors. And the details of that calculation is in my final report on cold fusion in the Navy in September 1996 on page 92. We'd like to thank Dr. Benjamin F. Bush. Wouldn't have been possible to do these studies without his measurements of helium-4 at the University of Texas, or at least correlating those studies. The US Navy for funding me at least for some of these years, 1992 to 1995. And then since 2005 and up till recently, I've had a private in, uh, funding. And if you look over the histories, other people followed that found helium for it. John O'Brockers was one of the early ones, 1992. Dr. Gossi in Italy, 1995 and again in 1997. Arata and Zhang in Japan, 1999. McCubrey in the US in uh, 2000 at ICCF meeting and Del Gusi, Italy in 2003 and Dinino in Italy 2006. And there are probably more, but these are the main ones I think that did these kind of studies, calorimetry calor studies and measuring helium-4. Okay, thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. <laughs>